So hello everyone, this is Carol Scott with the Ombudsman Resource Center. I wanna welcome you to, oh man, took away my- um, Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay, that's okay, that's okay. No, nope. I can stop. Wel welcome you to this session on uh, HCBS, serving HCBS uh, residents with the Ombudsman Program. Um, in the email that was uh, sent out to the State Ombudsman, um, uh, Bev and Heather's uh, PowerPoints are there and they'll be showing them uh, throughout this webinar or this training. And also there are some uh, resources on the uh, Consumer Voice and the um, uh, NORC website that are in, in that email. So. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Bev, um, who's gonna start us off. We'll um, follow that with Heather, and then we have time um, at the end for other states to share what they're doing, questions they may have. And both Bev and Heather have said, if you have questions, um, you are welcome to jump right in at the time. You don't have to wait till the end. So welcome everyone, and I'll turn it over to Bev. Okay, hi everybody. Um, first, I'll start with explaining um, why I'm wearing a t-shirt. First of all, because I knew you were all friends and wouldn't really care. Uh, and my t-shirt I just got yesterday, it says uh, zero G and I feel fine. It's John Glenn. And as I've been thinking, um, I was thinking about this presentation and sort of um, even the title here, we're at a real moment here. It's kind of um, throughout my career as state ombudsman, I've uh, always, taking advantage of being in the right place at the right time and um, taking risks. And uh, so, uh, and it seems to have worked out pretty well. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of um, the theme. Um, the, um, we're at a real moment here uh, is just a quote from somebody who used to work for um, our more, our last governor. Um, we had an office of healthcare transform, office of health transformation um, created on, in the cabinet, and um, the head of that office, um, he was uh, he's he taught me a lot of good lessons, and um, and that was one of the things he said. And uh, we started uh, soon after that we started um, really cracking down on poor quality nursing homes and uh, really developing um, home and community-based services in a more robust way, looking at quality in a different way and so on. So, um, so I've just always sort of carried that with me and it seems to fit a lot of situations um, that we're at a real moment here, sort of like carpe diem, let's, let's seize the day and uh, look for opportunities. So, um, so my presentation will sound like I'm um, an advocate for ombudsman programs in home and community-based services. I am. Uh, it has worked out um, well for us in Ohio, but I certainly understand that um, we're in a great position in Ohio. We have outstanding funding um, for our program, and it's it's just not for everybody. And so um, uh, Heather and I will talk about some of that as well. Um, this slide is, and Carol, please keep me on time. Let me know um, when I need to be wrapping up. Um, uh, this slide is uh, from, we have a, a university, a Scripps Gerontology Center at Miami University of Ohio that has a contract to do um, longitudinal long-term care research. And uh, so every couple of years, they do a survey of long-term care facilities. They analyze um, uh, where people are getting long-term services and supports. And um, in their uh, most recent uh, report, uh, they include this graphic and you can see the blue is the average daily Medicaid nursing facility census and the green is home and community-based service enrollment. So it really fits with, we're at a real moment here. You know, we have so many people now receiving home and community-based services and who's going to be their advocate if we aren't. So, um, you know, Again, they're waiver consumers in this case. And in Ohio, we serve getting home and community-based services. It's not just limited to waiver. I know that in some states, it's just waiver. Um, but if you think about the waiver population, 
the qualifications to be on a waiver are nursing facility level of care and meeting the Medicaid institutional needs standard. They're just like residents of long-term care facilities. So, uh, and in many cases, their ADL impairments are, are matched up um, with nursing facility residents. So they need an advocate just like uh, people in um, facilities do. Um, and uh, interesting, this is, um, this is just a shameless uh, quote here. Um, I checked it out with Patty. A few years ago, um, Patty Ducaye and I were asked to contribute to um, the second edition of the Oxford Handbook of Social Work in Health and Aging. And these are two of the quotes um, from that chapter that we wrote um, that uh, as things changed in um, long-term services and supports, ombudsman programs can be expected to adapt to a shifting landscape. Uh, and part of this was about systems advocacy as well, us um, being at the table in design of home and community-based services and um, policy development. Um, again, because, you know, if a person's in a nursing home or in assisted living, which, you know, is also considered home and community-based services in the Medicaid program, um, if someone's in a facility there's a lot of interplay now between the their time in the facility, they might be doing just there for rehab, and then they're going to have services in their home. So it's not, we can't live in silos um, anymore. And um, so I wanted to give you just a little bit of history that will be interesting to you. Uh, back in the year 2000, and actually I started before that, but the most recent revision, um, our own association, NASOP, um, developed a paper called Guidance for Ombudsman Program Participation in Developing Consumer Advocacy Programs. And we changed the title of it in 2000. Before that, it was just really focused on should ombudsman be ombudsman in home care. Uh, and so um, this paper is really very helpful in terms of um, the considerations um, that we should all pay attention to um, uh, as we're thinking about uh, modifying the scope of work in um, our programs. So um, that paper looks at structure uh, of the program. So, you know, in Ohio, um, I'm in the state unit on aging that manages part of the Medicaid waiver program, set of programs. Uh, so we have different conflicts of interest that we need to consider. Um, and so you have to look at the program structure, um, looking at qualifications of staff and um, uh, as you're kind of adding this to your portfolio of work, um, your legal authority, making sure that you have the same underpinnings um, in the home care arena that you do in facilities. Um, what are your resources? Of course, the huge question about resources. You don't want to venture into something that's going to draw resources away from our federal mandate um, in, in long-term care facilities, um, and ACL would care about that a lot. Um, and then, you know, just thinking about individual advocacy as well as systems advocacy, and I already mentioned kind of the systems advocacy role that even if you aren't going to be providing services, individual advocacy services in home and community-based um, settings, that we really should be at the table in policy considerations um, and systems advocacy related to home care. So we need to learn about it in some way anyway. Um, and then um, this other um, publication um, was put together um, by Lewin and um, uh, Research and Training Center at um, University of uh, Minnesota uh, for CMS about best practices for home and community-based ombudsmen. And that one is a 2013 publication. So those are two great resources for you to use as you're thinking about this. So I'll just give you just a little bit of Ohio history. Um, we had um, 
it was interesting again we were at a moment um, back in uh, around 1989 uh, when the ombudsman enabling law in ohio was being considered by our state legislature and at the same time um, we had a at the time a small medicaid home and community based service waiver for people age 60 and over called pass Sports. And uh, it's an acronym, so it's all caps. Um, so uh, Passport was um, about the same time uh, uh, expanding the demonstration um, to become statewide. And so when our law was going through, we thought, well, Passport's expanding, people are going to need us, let's just go ahead and take the leap. And so um, we had some funding that was attached, so that was good. It was also around the uh, budget time. Uh, so we got some funding uh, and so we added community-based long-term care services to the definition of the work that we do uh, in Ohio. So this is kind of our legal authority. It specifically lists certain um, services and then Number 11 is kind of the magic, you know, when an ombudsman says, do we do this? Or a consumer calls and says, do you do that? I always look at number 11 in our statute. Any other health and social services provided to people that allow them to retain their independence in their own homes or community care settings. So that takes us in um, a lot of directions. Uh, and then our definition of recipient in our statute is a recipient of community-based long-term services and where appropriate includes prospective, previous, or deceased recipients. So it's the same as, you know, we have a definition of resident in facilities, it's the same. Um, okay, so um, core ombudsman services in Ohio. You know, I've kind of talked about all of the things to consider. These are our services, advocacy, systems development, uh, information and assistance to providers, um, having a regular presence, uh, INA to individuals, and of course, complaint resolution. And the mission of the Ombudsman Office in Ohio is to advocate for excellence in long-term services and supports wherever consumers live. And whenever I tell somebody our mission, I always emphasize that, wherever consumers live. And that's really one of the, the barriers that we've had to having more complaints in home and community-based services is awareness. That's been a huge challenge. Um, this is just a quote from uh, someone who uh, was part of a survey, I think, um, or some research um, it, from a consumer. It's been a very helpful program for me, very informative. Ombudsman is helpful in locating organizations that could help. This is a list of our top complaints. And I gave you this many because we don't get a lot of home care complaints. So uh, my advice to you is don't worry about being overwhelmed. I think it's easy to start this slowly if you're thinking about doing it. Um, and uh, case management has always been our top complaint in home and community-based services. And, and I think the reason for that is, um, I, I know the reason for that is typically if a person has a problem, especially if they're in a waiver program, if they have a problem, they're gonna call their case manager. That's what they should do. The case manager should fix the problem. Well, if they don't, and then they end up with an ombudsman, our complaint is usually about the case manager didn't fix my problem. So we just kind of thought about reframing our program uh, in terms of um, ombudsman professional development. How did we need to develop skills for our ombudsman? What kinds of relationships did we need to have? Um, relationships with different organizations, you know, not just the nursing home association anymore. The now we needed to talk about, talk to um, the home care association and um, working with Medicaid in a different way, different people at Medicaid, different people at the survey agency, um, developing awareness tools, and of course, funding. Those were all things that we had to say, okay, if we are going to tear this down to the studs and rebuild, what do we need to do? Um, so professional development, different laws and regulations. In Ohio, 
until one year from now, um, we have not licensed um, home care agencies in Ohio. So we didn't have the same kind of underpin underpinning that we have with long-term care facilities and the things that we can fall back on if we're having a problem with resolving a, pro with resolving a complaint. So ombudsmen have to be more skilled at being um, good negotiators to try to solve problems because they can't go back and say, well, we'll just call the survey agency because the survey agency isn't that helpful. Um, but a law was just passed um, that Ohio will be licensing those agencies in about a year. Um, and then just systems differences, um, you know, different considerations. Uh, relationships, I, I was thinking, I, I had a similar PowerPoint and I was going back through them. And so this is sort of like the, the evolution of my hair. Um, so I was a little more gray here. Um, as we um, developed relationships with care managers, hospitals became more important to us, um, talking with hospitals and discharge planning, um, different sets of providers, Medicaid regulators, and so on. Um, you know, awareness tools make it easy. You know, we developed a requirement for um, all home and community-based services, um, like Title III services under the Older Americans Act, Medicaid waiver programs. They have to tell consumers about the ombudsman program. So we just made it easy and said, here, just give people this uh, information that explains um, what we do. Um, and then we also cultivate relationships with legislators and the media so um, they know to call us um, when there are home care situations as well as um, nursing home problems. So our funding, um, you know, when again, we're at a real moment here, take advantage of opportunities when quality of care in home and community-based services and shifting of resources became a priority, I looked at it as an opportunity and, and went to um, the director of aging and said, hey, we're, we're the best game in town to solve problems for consumers. So um, I know that you have some money you need to spend and I'm happy to take it off your hands. And so we were able to expand our budget um, pretty significantly um, back in the early 90s. And then um, we lost some during the recession. And um, in the last uh, three years, we were able to expand it again. So we went from a low, well, I guess of zero, and then it was 500,000, and then it was a million, and then it was 477,000 for several years, and now we're up to $3.1 million um, in state um, revenue, in addition to about a million in our ombudsman bed fee. We took advantage of the opportunity um, when MFP demonstrations started. Um, we found a role for ourselves, for ombudsmen, and that brought in some additional revenue of a couple of million dollars for a few years, several years, uh, and then kind of backed out of that. Um, so my advice to you on funding is don't compartmentalize the funding. So you'll see just in these little snips here um, back in um, the 90s, um, our fund, funding line was called Home Care Ombudsman and Boarding Home Investigations. That um, created too much of a pigeonhole for us. So uh, we changed it to um, just State Ombudsman uh, in our funding, um, the name of the line. So it gives us great thought flexibility. We didn't have to um, uh, figure out, well, what dollar did you use to provide that service? Um, we, we have significant state funding now that we don't have to worry too much about, oh, uh, let's not use any of our federal money for our home care work because we don't have that authority. Um, but with your state sources and local sources, just you know, be careful about compartmentalizing them too much. So just a few examples here of um, cases. Estelina um, uses a walker for mobility. She was in a nursing home for eight months. We supported her in advocating for her to be able to return home. Um, and you know, when we visited her back in her home, then when she left the facility, she was laughing, smiling, more engaged than she was in the nursing home. And then this is a long story, I won't um, read it to you, but it was basically a situation where um, a consumer had a bill for dialysis services and other things that didn't make sense. This is related to our work in managed care um, and how the ombudsman resolved it. And then this was a big transportation problem um, that a consumer had 
very simple a head scratcher. You know, the transportation company wasn't familiar with the area where the consumer lived, so they canceled her trip. What on earth? Um, so the ombudsman said, okay, let's solve this problem. Let's get to the root cause of this problem and let's solve it. Uh, so the waiver program then flagged the member's account. So when that member, I say member, member of a managed care um, waiver program, um, just Ohio lingo, sorry, I thought I took that out. Um, so the consumer, um, you know, whenever she needed transportation, then um, it would be flagged and the provider would be informed of, you know, um, and then provide advanced notification of trips and so on. So just a few examples of um, how we work in home and community-based services. I could give you more, but uh, maybe in conversation that will come up. So that is it for me. Um, I'll take questions um, and then we'll move on to Heather. Oh, Mary typed in, is the provider fee your bed tax? If so, how were you able to get that for the ombudsman program? Yeah, um, it's actually not the bed tax that you're probably thinking of, Mary. Um, we have a separate in our statute an ombudsman bed fee. So every facility-based provider pays us, um, when it was new, it was $3 per bed per year. And then during that recession, I mentioned when we lost some of our general revenue funding, I said, you got to help us. We, we, need, we need money. Um, you, gotta, you can't just take away all of that money. It was like cutting it in half. And so the General Assembly said, well, then what we'll do is we will just double your bed fee. And that's what we did. So now at $6 per bed per year, we really, it, it's surprising um, that providers pay it. Um, we, we'd have no problem with it, honestly. And if the provider doesn't pay it, they get certified to the attorney general's office as delinquent and the fee gets doubled. So that gives us about a million a year. So if you think about it, a 100 bed nursing home pays, a six, pays us $600 per year. That's nothing to them. Uh, and they get a lot of benefit. You know, they get consultation, they get uh, problem resolution, short of regulation. So it's kind of a good deal for them. Uh, Mark. Yeah, Bev, thanks. And actually, I probably should have saved this for both you and, uh, and, and Heather. But, you know, as we look at this in the district, one of my one of my one of the issues that I that I think I struggle with is, do you have separate dedicated staff and do you train and certify them separately from other ombudsman staff? So in the beginning, um, we did. I was a regional ombudsman at the time that we started this, and um, we hired um, a person who would become the expert on home and community based services. She did the research. She developed the relationships. And then um, after we did that initial infrastructure and we weren't really getting a lot of complaints. So for efficiency and to avoid compartmentalizing too much, we just said, hey, an ombudsman is an ombudsman is an ombudsman in Ohio. And so everyone gets certified the same way now. Thanks, that's kind of, that's how we're currently doing it in the district. It's just same training. Yeah. Have some special, have a couple of specialists that. Mm -hmm. deal with our home care issues but yeah thanks that asks are the bed fees for um, nursing homes and assisted living uh, nursing homes assisted living and what we call residential facilities class two um, group homes three to 16 residents so they all pay everything that is a physical structure um, you know, long-term care we've tried to figure out how to to extend that fee to um, home care agencies. And we haven't figured it out yet just because enrollment changes and that's hard. It's easier to count a licensed bed than it is to count a slot um, when people are coming in and out. And so it's more challenging. We, our fiscal guy, um, previous fiscal guy uh, actually thought about doing it based on um, sort of, um, like an income tax um, to the um, home and community-based service um, entity. We didn't do that, um, but it is something that we've thought about. Of when of the smart again, when did you when did you do that? Because I'm thinking trying to get a two, three dollar bed fee <laughs> out of providers here in the district. I, I just can't even imagine what that fight would look like at the moment. 
Yeah, our fee started back in 1990. Um, so we've we've done it as long as our, our law has been in effect. Um, so it started in 90 and gosh, when was the recession? I don't remember um, when we ended up doubling it. But honestly, again, if you if you talk about it in terms of it's, you know, for a 100 bed facility, it's $300 a year, $600 a year. Come on, that's really nothing. Beth, um, turn it over now to Heather. All right, thanks, Bev. It's good to see everyone today. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, we've been in home and community based services since 1981 when we started the had the community options program. And I don't know if any of you are uh, familiar with that, but that was home based. And our program, if maybe we'd have a case once a year. So um, it was very, um, very intensive if you did get a case, but times have changed. So just as a refresher, we are a state agency. So all my staff, I have 20 ombudsmen that report to two supervisors. I have three lead ombudsmen that, that do technical assistance. I have one that does facility-based. And importantly, secondly, I have a specific lead ombudsman that does technical assistance for managed care. So that is really critical because of the complexity of managed care. And then lastly, I have a lead for um, I respect I self-direct, which is self-directed services that we provide. Um, and I'll share a little bit more later. And then we have our intake specialists. So as a state agency, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to roll out a program um, because you ha have control of all of your staff. So, um, oh, Carol, are you starting my PowerPoint? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Okay, I will share my screen, I'm so sorry. All right, can you see my screen? No. Isn't that just great? Not yet. Well, you know how that it just kind of consumes your your screen. Um, can you send it to Carol and maybe Carol can pull it up? Well, Carol should have it. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Hang on. Okay. Sorry about that. Wonder why it's not working. Well, I apologize. Now, are you able to see it? We're just seeing um, the power. We don't see the PowerPoint, but we see the power. We see the blanks. We see, the pro we see your PowerPoint program, just not your slide yet. Isn't that just funny? Well, Carol, do you have any luck? Uh, well, if you'll stop sharing, let me I see will. what I can do. Okay, I'm so sorry, everyone. I just love these technical issues. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks a million. There you, go. you got All it. Right. Yeah. All right, so yeah. breaking, we had some yeah. really, <laughs> we had some significant breaking news uh, that Wisconsin eliminated their wait list for all long-term care services for Medicaid eligible adults. So everybody that was in our managed care program over the age of 60, had access to services. And that was really a monumental. That happened February 28th. We actually had a 40 year old person was the last person on the wait list um, uh, for any Medicaid eligible adults. I should apologize. It's just not 16 older, but any adult. So that was really significant for our state. Now our next task is to tackle the children's services. So we were pretty, pretty happy about that. 
The next slide, I just wanted to share um, our relationship with the Secretary of Health Services. No matter who the secretary is, is really a cr critical relationship. So when we hit that milestone in the state of Wisconsin, she called me up and she said, Heather, we need to celebrate this. How do we want to celebrate it? And so we're in the process of planning a huge event. We're going to have some consumers. So we're trying to gather up individuals um, to be a part of this event. And of course, with COVID, it's been a little difficult. We really wanted to roll it out in May, and now it's been pushed to August, and now it's been pushed to fall. So we'll see. But it's really, you know, the Secretary addressed four decades of work by the advocates, meaning the Ombudsman Program, the state and county agency staff, tribal leaders, legislators, stakeholders, families, self-advocates. So, you know, Karen Timberlake is our um, secretary currently, and just, it's really a, a wonderful success for us. So uh, that relationship is really critical. Next slide, I just wanted to share a little bit of history of our family care. So in the late 1990s, my predecessor um, sat around a table with a group of stakeholders and advocates and said, we need to change. Community options program is costing so much money. We kind of need to look at how are we rolling out our long-term care services? The waiting lists are so long and we need to do better. So we really uh, put the effort forward. Um, I started with the Ombudsman program in 2000. So I was a part of that um, planning group and part of um, this, those really important discussions. So we did a pilot in four counties five counties and we just showed some great success and we added more counties in 2007 and then by the end of 2010 we were serving over 30,000 members in 56 counties we have 72 counties in the state so because research showed the family care costs less than other programs uh, we really you know gathered the data the statistics and presented to the legislature and today we're in all the counties so that was really a great success in 2018. We actually took authority for our ombudsman program in 2009. So we had community of options program up to 2009 and when then we opened our doors to family care and we received one position. <laughs> so as Bev said, you know, we have one position, how are we going to make this work? So we chose to cross train to Mark to ask, ask answer your question. We cross trained all of our staff um, to have the capabilities of, of working with um, all those members. And really the, you'll see there's some very unique pieces in managed care, but for overall, the investigation, the mediation, negotiation, all of those skills really were, were beneficial for everyone. On the next slide, this was really what made Wisconsin successful is we actually had a charter back in 99 where, when we had those stakeholders, we actually started a long-term care advisory council. And to this day, we still have that council. So we're monitoring managed care, we're monitoring our you know, managed care organizations, all of the, the funding sources. Um, so this council is meets Ooh. six times a year. And as the state ombudsman, I have the honor and pleasure of chairing it. So the sec I've gone through eight secretaries through the Department of Health Services and each time I get reappointed. So I'm just always so thrilled uh, because it's such an important world. I have access to all of those stakeholders on that council and we have keep the ombudsman front and center in all those meetings. So when I know many of you have managed care, but if you're thinking about that, get those stakeholders together and start the conversation because it's, it's very successful when everybody's in agreement and, and including um, you know, the Secretary of the Department of Health Services. So I just, I can't believe it's been 13 years going on 14 years of chairing this council, but it's, it's really puts visibility to the Ombudsman program. The next slide, I just wanted to share some of the goals of our family care program that we as Ombudsman, you know, really, really find extremely important choice access, quality, and cost effectiveness. Um, when we had the community options program, I, I'll never forget one of my cases in the COP program as an ombudsman. I, I went to this person's house and they were upset because they needed a new scooter. And uh, the county said, well, we can't give you another scooter. And I said, well, what's the scenario? Well, here every year, the county had given him a new scooter and he had six scooters in his garage, all in oh. great shape. 
<laughs> so I was like, wow, it's, you know, that's $15,000 for seven scooters. Add that up. You have to wonder why we were having issues with cost effectiveness. So that was an interesting conversation. And you know what? The great outcome of that was six, six people got new scooters um, out of that within that county. So that was pretty neat uh, outcome of that. And, you know, the residents thought, well, this is a benefit. Why not take it? Each year I get a new scooter. They have all these, you know, bells and whistles. So uh, that, that was just a really fun story. The other piece, next slide, please, Carol, um, our adult long-term care system overview. So Wisconsin was one of the pilots when we did the aging and disability resource centers. Our um, Department of Health Service Administration really many, many decades ago, you know, the ADRC was our entry point into the long-term care system for Wisconsin. So, you know, functional eligibility, um, financial uh, options, counseling, and then at all of those visits that people participate in um, get our ombudsman contact information. So right from the get-go, maybe they're not ready to access managed care or long-term care system, but they have our numbers. So that is really, really important that they know that we are a resource. So our managed care organizations in Wisconsin were locally grown. Next slide, please. Each covers multiple counties and members have a choice. So when we first started, it wasn't always that, it was maybe two managed care organizations. We went through bankruptcies of some managed care organizations and now we really have it right that the Office of Commissioner's Insurance monitors the fiscal pieces of those managed care organizations. So they have to have an emergency fund, they have to have reserves. Um, and so the, the Department of Health Services really manages and enforces the contract procurement processes. So it's it's really pretty solid system and uh, with the managed care organizations. So with the managed care, next slide, please. Um, each MCO receives the same capitated rate, uses capitated rates to cover all administrative services and costs. When our managed care organization started, their administrative and service costs were skyrocketing. And that needed to be changed because the administration costs took away from the member costs. So we had, it took years to correct that, but we did. Um, develop a provider network and contracts and then care teams. So each managed care organization has a member rights specialist. So that member rights specialist within that managed care system has the ability to be the advocate. So our ombudsman work really closely with those member rights specialists. Next slide, please. One of the observations that we have as ombudsmen is some, sometimes that MCO staff can be very paternalistic um, in some of their, so when we get involved, you know, we really have to get back to that person-centered care. Um, so that's really imp very important. I know Bev said that they don't get a lot of complaints. So we do. <laughs> We're very active in our family care. So we have 25,000 plus 60 and older consumers that access um, the family care benefit. Partnership and PACE, I'm not gonna spend any time in, but those are also included in our advocacy. Um, and then the I respect, include respect I self-direct. That's the self-directed advocacy. I think we're one of the few in the country that are doing that. So we have two separate staff that actually um, provide um, that service self-directed and someday I'd love to share more about that because we cover the entire spectrum now for long-term care and self-directed services are really vital. Um, you know, that's really the principles of self-determination and self-direction. So they have the freedom to decide. Um, so what I'd like to share also with the, the statistics, we have Disability Rights Wisconsin that serves people 59 and under. So we're really fortunate to have, uh, you know, we're so busy with our own casework. It's nice that we have another entity managing those cases. When they took over, um, disability took over the advocacy, they kind of mirrored our system, not as much as I wanted to them to, but for the most part, it's pretty consistent statewide. So they have staff throughout the state that do family care investigations. Next slide, please. So ombudsman services, as I said, we cover all of these um, types of individual services, information and education, the same investigative process, technical assistance, 
to prepare for hearings and appeals. So this is very time consuming and I'll, I'll share a little bit more. All services are free and confidential. I am just would be thrilled if we could get bills or our bevs set up of the bed tax. Oh, what I love that. Um, so someday that's my dream. Um, and services can be requested at any point. I will share with you, next slide please, that our casework for managed care takes three times the amount of versus facility-based care, and which is really, really important to know um, because of, of the differences of going into someone's home, they're bringing in services. It takes a lot to, to um, do the, the casework. Next slide, systems advocacy. Um, we identify trends and patterns regarding managed care. We're always looking for emerging issues and trends that we report to the department. So we meet with the department on a regular basis to share, here's what we're seeing um, in the communities um, in our casework and how can we do better as a, as a state. We, we really provide a lot of policy development. So the managed care organizations have to follow the contract and we have the opportunity to review the contract every year. Bev talked about collaboration with relationships, MCOs, ADRCs, the department, IRS contractors, hospitals, all of the entities that are involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, with our clients. We educate and share program data with the governor, legislators, and long-term care stakeholders about the work that we do with the ombudsman program. So that's really important. Um, this last biennial budget, I requested two more positions. Um, and primarily because our managed care work has gotten to be so busy. I shared all of the data and we, we could not capture new positions. It was the first time in 14 years that we couldn't build our program. So I really um, was a little discouraged, but it was more of a political issue, I think in the, in the long run, but I will continue to advocate in the next biennial budget. We will really show the need of our, our casework and the demands. Next slide, please. I think I just really wanted to share typical facility based advocacy versus managed care advocacy. So, you know, you have access, you're right in the home, you have all of the staff present. It's largely collaborative, resident focused. You know, you can interpret regulatory guidance, immediate access to residents, records. Um, residents in home have their constant, well, not so much anymore with constant caregivers because of the staffing issues, um, but really. Uh, the other area retaliation is less probable due to the constant supports of staff. Next slide. So this is our managed care advocacy. You know, after advocacy is requested for us um, by the member, we attempt to informally resolve issues. That is our ultimate goal. If we can do it within um, their home and informally, that is the best outcome. However, relationships sometimes centered on contract compliance, some MCOs collaborate more easily than others. So, you know, we, we, the member brings us in, they give us permission to communicate with the managed care organization and, and it's not always a perfect fit in some of those conversations. The contracts focus uh, are very black and white, uh, best resolution when we're able to solve the problem before any formal decision is made. So if the, the, the resolution or the complaint can't be resolved, there is a notice of action. It's a formal document and that moves us forward to a, a hearing and appeal and grievance structure. And that, all of that is laid out in the, the regu regulatory um, statute that we have for the state of Wisconsin. You know, access to records and personnel can be challenging for us at times. Uh, family care members seem to have few constants, different staff different home health, different entities coming in and out. So sometimes that is really difficult to try to get everybody in on the same page. Care and treatment issues of contracted care management units is a challenge. And then retaliation is a concern. If they have an issue with their caregiver that comes in five days a week, um, you know, that is a concern. We get a lot of calls about retaliation and those are really um, very time consuming, but very important cases for us. So at the end of the day, they feel comfortable in their own home. And then we work with the managed care, we work with the home health to make sure that the member always feels safe. And then we really promote self-advocacy and really try to empower our members. Next slide, please. So if we can't resolve the process informally, we'd go to a formal appeals grievances and fair hearings. Member makes the request for newer change services. 
Um, I'll give you an example. We had a resident who um, the managed care organization wanted to drop five hours a week for their services. And clearly we could not, um, this resident would really significantly have issues if those hours were declined. So we work with the member um, and we, managed care says no. So we they get the notice of action, give their reasons for denial. And then the ombudsman starts to get engaged. Next slide, please. Oftentimes when the managed care organization makes these denials, we have very little time. Hearings and appeals get scheduled and sometimes in those letters of notice of action, sometimes um, the ombudsman program information is in front and center. So sometimes we get that call and say, oh, I only have two days till my hearing. So then we, that case goes as a priority to the top of the list. So family care is two options for appeal and internal by the committee or then the state fair hearing. So benefits continue during the appeal process, short, strict timeline, as I said. And then this is really important to know, member could be held liable for cost of services provided during the appeal process if the member loses the appeal. So okay. it is really important that we have all of the facts, the documents, the evidence to, to why, um, you know, person shouldn't lose their services or equipment or supplies or staffing. So this five hour person, we had evidence to show that um, every day why these hours were critical. And and I will will say we win the majority of our appeals, knock on wood, um, but they are very intense um, and you're in front of an administrative law judge. So uh, having an advocate for managed care in those particular situations is just vital. And then the last, I think I have two slides left. I just kind of wanted to update you. I know Bev shared her funding. Uh, we have general state dollars, um, federal dollars, and the Medicaid match. So what's really important to know is I have to have state dollars in order to capture any Medicare match. So if I have $6,000, $100,000 funded for the Ombudsman program, I have to have state dollars to match that 600,000 the Medicaid match. So I think the tricky part of all of this is we do 15 minute time reporting. And I know that is a process in itself. You know, you're trying to roll out a managed care program and then you're trying to do 15 minute time reporting. We've been doing 15 minute time reporting um, as long as the agency's been, you know, in, um, in existence. So it's, Funding is really critical that we really document and staff. So it's a big transition if you aren't doing 15 minute time reporting, but it, it's definitely benefiting for us to get the money and then provide the advocacy services. So really, really um, important. And then my last slide um, is the best result for the individuals. I love this Henry Ford uh, quote, coming together is the beginning. So if you're thinking about managed care, bring everybody together that has the best interest for the consumers you serve. Staying together is progress. We've had, we had a lot of tough conversations. How are we gonna make this work? How is the legislature and the governor gonna respond? Can we do this? Yes, we can, because who's gonna benefit the consumers that we serve in the, in the long run? And working together is success. So at the end of the day, um, you know, we, as Bev said, it was the right thing for us to do. I'll, I'll never look back. And, you know, four or five years ago, when we took over the IRIS, the self-directed advocacy, they looked to us and said, what do you think? And we said, absolutely. So we have all uh, services for our consumers, whether they're living in a home, in a facility, assisted living, managed care or self-directed, we, we have all of the advocacy. So thanks so much for letting me share. I appreciate it. And let me know if you have any questions. Oops, I think I just, I think I just muted you and I didn't mean to do that. Um, yeah. I, th I think this question was for, for um, Bev, um, who collects the bed fee? What department is it paid to? Well, um, it's paid to the Department of Aging and we collect it basically. We send out my, I have staff who um, put together our invoices. We work with our um, systems division and our fiscal division. 
and uh, we're just about ready to do it. Um, we send out invoices. Now we're trying to get more electronic payments. Um, we give them 30 days to pay, and then we give them another, a little extra time. Uh, and if they haven't paid in 90 days, then the attorney general's office does collections and doubles the fee, and they also take um, collection fees. So, um, so it all gets processed in um, our office at the Department of Aging. I see these these questions about uh, uh, Donna McDowell and who was in high school in eighty one oh. and in college. I love it. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. got was in high school. Somebody was kind of off on their accounting. I think so. Um, yeah. So Heather, um, you indicated that the ombudsman activities, the HCBS ombudsman activities and complaints cases, take three times as long. Do you? You kind of mentioned that you track in 15 minute um, things, but do you have a separate database that you collect the data or do you use Ombuds Manager or have a homegrown system? It's a good question. So we use Ombuds Manager and then we had to create, you know, our own codes and things like Bev had to do. But yes, so we, we can break it out and, and see the time difference. And that's what, we, what, what we've really done in this last biennial budget showing. It was really significant, um, the time. What takes you maybe a week, may take you a month to six weeks um, in managed care, so. Thank you, sure. uh, Mark. Yeah, I've got a couple, couple of questions. First, I, you know, the, the, the financing, the funding is, the, is our, I would say our biggest hurdle. You know that we're we don't have a special assessment fee. We're not getting we're getting some Medicaid state dollars, not Medicaid federal admin dollars. So we don't have to match. But for us, and I, I imagine a number of other states that are trying to do this, that's that's a that's a huge challenge to to get over. But Heather, I was I was going to ask you a couple things. So you were talking about these um, member rights specialists. Are they like the case managers? No, they have case managers within the uh, managed care organization, but this is kind of a, the, the case manager has an issue about a right issue. They would go to the member rights specialist. So it's another layer. Gotcha. And then we, um, in, in the district, we're helping anybody on a waiver that's over 18. But I think you had mentioned you're only serving people 60 and over. Yep, so what just, happens to the other, yep. what happens to the other people that call you? So Disability Rights Wisconsin manages 59 and under. So they would handle um, those cases. And we have a lot of people between 59 and 60 that call us. And if they're yeah. 59 and a half, we take them. Um, we just kind of have that agreement between disability rights because sometimes it could be a six month situation. So we would rather follow them through the end than right. pass them, pass them back and forth. Our our cases take a little bit longer only because just like yours and probably Bev's, but only because we're, we don't close them until after they go through an appeal process. If they're like appealing a termination or reduction in service hours. So it just, it's just a longer process. Our original statute was 60 and over, but a lot of the complaints we were getting were from people who were younger on the, um, younger Medicaid waiver program. So we took out the age restriction. You know, when we, the funding like Mark addressed is so complicated. So if I ever, if I request, like in this last biennial budget, I had to go through the Department of Health Services fiscal and say, all right, I can, I'm gonna ask for the state GPR. Can you assist with, you know, getting additional match for me at the federal level? So there's always so many layers. And then you work with the executive branch budget office to make sure is, you know, are we doing this correctly? Um, and then, so there are so many layers, but really in the long run, it, it is worth the time and the investment of, of making that happen. But really there's so many entities involved when, when you're trying to fund this program. Thanks. Well, I would imagine that um, some of you that are listening in already have a program. Do you have tips or thoughts that you would like to share with, with everyone? Sorry. 
So this is Joni in Virginia. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Bev and Heather for terrific presentations. Um, and you all had, you know, different pieces of information in each of yours. So it was um, just really comprehensive and really got to the meat of things. Um, and, and also to say thank you, because I think both of you all have been resources to our state when we were looking at this and playing it out in our heads. Um, so I think, you know, having this kind of conversation and making this information available to other ombuds is really important, especially at this moment, Bev. <laughs> so it is a moment. I mean, it really is. And I think we've, a lot of us have felt that all along and the whole system is changing underneath us and the, the preponderance of care is moving toward community. And I know that um, I probably had just a half an idea of what our state was getting into when we launched in this direction. So it was really on a gut instinct of what was right conceptually um about whether to go in this direction or not and i can't say enough about while it's been overwhelming sometimes in many ways i think it is so the right decision for a program that does connect the individual advocacy and the systems advocacy and i think you know we talk about person-centered care and it just makes so much sense to have person-centered advocacy and with all the transitioning between settings to be able to be that single solitary go-to advocate that can carry support for the individual through those settings in a person-centered um, resident directed way is just so critical. So just wanted to throw that in, but mostly to say thank you. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, this is Victor here. Um, in not well, thank you, Bev and uh, Heather, for the presentations. You know, yeah, I think uh, they kind of they took me down the memory lane. You know, uh, when yeah, when I was in Delaware, we implemented that in uh, uh, 2010. So I was I was very instrumental in uh, you know putting the data and everything together. I'm in North Carolina now. We do not have it home community based in North Carolina. But one thing that uh, North Carolina has done is uh, uh, a couple months ago. Uh, they implemented the uh, managed care, okay, and uh, you know I, I work with uh, uh, some of the staff in the Medicaid, um, <clears throat> you know, to put together information. They do have the uh, the ombudsman for the managed care, okay. That's separate from us, from us, you know. Unlike in Delaware, where we had the two parallel programs. Over here, we do have the uh, long term care within the state unit on aging, and then the uh, Managed care ombudsman for the uh, uh, for the Medicaid, you know, uh, you, know Medi you know, Medicaid unit, you know. But uh, it's pretty interesting just listening to both of you, and uh, you know, um, and I think one of the things I like to get to people again is um, somewhere down the line when we talk about long term care support services, you know, what we're seeing is okay, people, you know, you share information with the managed care entities and things of that nature, you know. But what we're seeing also is, you know. People in long term care are the ones that will try, it's, it's a revolving door. You see them also in the community and then they're back in long term care, some of them, you know. So basically, you, you simply just following them around and everything, you know. But I think thank you so much for what you do. And, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, I learned a lot from both of you. And again, took me down the memory lane, you know. And Mark also, what you do in the DC, you know, because I recall, you know, working with Mary and Co, you know, way back then, you know. Yeah, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, how about some of you? Um, oh well, I see Amanda has just written in. Um, is there a requirement or expectation that states will provide services other than to residents of ALFs and SNFs? We have certified family homes, but investigate very few complaints. Our ALFs are our HCBS residents we serve. So at this point, um, there, there's not an, uh, any movement at the federal level that I'm aware of that would expand the ombudsman, the long-term care ombudsman services to anyone outside of institutional settings. Um, so any all these 
um, home and community or HCBS work um, is state funded only or from other funds other than what we what is get gotten from um, ACL. And I think um, it and it'd be interesting, Bev, if, and any of you that run a, a home and community based service. Um, as we see more people getting HCBS services in assisted living, um, there is a need to understand how that system works. Um, even if you're not really doing um, HCBS work, um, you're going to come across people. So Heather, Bev, comments, thoughts, and anyone else? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a bit of a mix. In the district, we have probably 40 people that are on the waiver, but are, received, that are, but are in assisted living facilities. So there's some of that mix, right? And I think as time goes on for a lot of us, we're gonna see more of that. And it just complicates things a little bit. So, because generally assisted living is defined as a, it's an institutional setting. It's not generally, I don't think, considered home and community-based services. Some states may define it a little differently, but at the federal level, that's obviously not the case. And so it's just, it, I, I think it complicates this a little bit. Um, at some point, perhaps ACL will start to look at that expansion you know, my experience tells me though, don't do that unless you're, it's gonna come with a pile of money because just as with assisted living and the growth in assisted living, we didn't get additional funding. And so we're kind of behind the eight ball. I'd hate to see, we add on a whole nother group of folks without any way to really support the infrastructure of the program. But I think we're gonna see more of this. People are qualifying that are actually living in a facility, what we would consider a facility-based setting. Yeah, Mark, we have a lot of uh, people who go through the options counseling that choose the family care benefit for assisted living. And I think one of the biggest challenges we're seeing, especially this last year, um, is the, the amount that the family care benefit is sometimes paying the assisted living just isn't the, enough. So you know, there's a lot of negotiation between the facility and the managed care organization. And then we get pulled in when they're saying, oh, you know, we can't support you on that amount. So we're going to discharge you. So we've just seen an, an uptick of an incredible amount of discharge notices. And, you know, some of these people have lived in those home 10 years or more. I mean, this has become their home. So we've really had to go in and argue. And, and those are some of the big appeals that we have won. It said, you know, the judge is saying, what, you're going to uproot this person who's been there for 10 years to at 88 years old. Uh, so, you know, some very compelling stories, but it also is challenging when, you know, they just don't have the money. The other thing is, you know, with facility, nursing homes, especially really focusing on rehab, you know, trying to increase their bottom line using Medicare, um, you know, people are in and out of facilities and to, you know, go solve a problem um, with, you know, the social worker is not helping me get home fast enough, you know, to resolve that complaint. And then on the day they leave to say, well, it's been nice knowing you. And then they're on their own in the home care setting without an advocate. That's, that's hard. And it feels kind of, it feels artificial, you know, just, it's, um, I think we need to be, you know, uh, have a different perspective on that. And philosophically, it makes sense. It's made sense right. for a long time that, particularly now that you're right, Bev, things aren't static, right? I mean, right. People come and go and get rehab and go back home and all that. <clears throat> so it's, you know, I think theoretically, philosophically, it makes sense you have an advocate that covers all, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like your your mission. It's like, you, yeah. We're your, we're your advocate no matter where you're getting the service. I think it's just that takes a huge, from where we are at this point, just a huge infrastructure change in terms of funding and staffing and mm -hmm. every, everything else. And, uh, you know, right now, a third of our complaints, uh, last year, a third of our complaints were home and community-based service issues. 
Mm -hmm. So we, we see it, um, but it's just, it's, it puts a strain on our system. So. Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, with um, Title Three e the caregiver, family caregiver support, you know, we said when that was new, um, NASOP said, you know, caregiving doesn't stop at the nursing home door. And some of that money needs to be used to support family members of nursing home residents, you know, they need help too. Um, it's hard to be a family member of a nursing home resident, um, but we haven't, haven't made headway there uh, either. So yeah, it's, um, it's, you know, maybe, a lot of work to be done. Maybe we need a beta retreat just to look at. There you uh, go. Oh my goodness. Heather, can you help us out with that? <laughs> <laughs> so Heather, um, is the MCO required to have managed care rights specialists? Yes. Yes, every organization, every managed care organization in the state of Wisconsin has an MCQ. Yep. And do either of, or any of you that run a volunteer uh, run a HCBS program? Do you utilize volunteers, or is this mostly driven by staff? In Ohio, it's mostly staff. We started down the path of getting volunteers more involved, especially um, in those situations where someone was discharging to home to have the volunteer you know, establish that relationship with them in the facility and then follow them home basically to say, we're still here for you. But our regional programs just weren't comfortable with volunteers going to people's individual homes. And so we, we do try to educate our volunteers about our role in home care so they can, you know, do that relationship building part um, in the facility. But so far, we haven't uh, used volunteers in home care settings, unless it's somebody who, I don't know, used to be a nurse in home care and, you know, was comfortable with it. But, but, but Carol, I think, the, oh, I'm sorry. I think the, the, the concern also about sending volunteers to personal homes will be, you're looking at safety and you're also looking at, uh, you know, not all, not all volunteers are off right. You know, so some of, of some volunteers might get in there and you know uh, lay their hands on whatever debit card or whatever. You know, let me go do this for you, and you know, and, and you know how that ends up. You know, so I think you know. So basically, I think it's just safe and best for a program to you know restrict just the volunteers to long-term care as opposed to going to individual homes. Yeah, I agree, Victor. You know, contract interpretation, um, the appeals and hearing process. I mean, when you get that case, that is tough. That is complex. And and when we go to those hearings, our technical ombudsman really provides a lot of guidance. So I, yep. And, and especially during the pandemic, oh my goodness, boy, did we, some of our members didn't have technology. Some people didn't even have access to PPE. It was complicated. And um, so, you know, we, we would do, they would have a drop box out of their, out of their apartment or home and we would take paperwork to them and just drop it and then leave. And I mean, we had to have access because some of these appeals and hearings, even though there were delays and we're still, um, you know, dealing with some of those COVID issues, it, it that was very complex work, it continues to be. And Suzanne has just said, uh, Victor raises a good point. Are there um, specific safety precautions or trainings that you address with your ombudsman who go into individuals' uh, homes? We do. And, um, you know, interestingly, OSHA has a specific, uh, specific guidance for um, social service personnel who do go into people's individual homes. It's very um, helpful. And so we use that um, kind of guidebook um, to educate our staff um, because that's we have heard those concerns. And uh, so we did a kind of a round of a few years ago, a round of refresher training on how to be safe. You know, go go to the house and drive by, 
pay attention to who's around. Are there cars in the driveway? Uh, back in, uh, make sure that you have an easy way to leave. Don't get yourself your own vehicle. Don't get in between other cars, you know, just those sorts of things. Pay attention. What does the porch look like? Are there other people living in the home? Why are they living in the home? Um, are they are they employed? You know, so all of the things that would would make the consumer vulnerable to abuse and neglect. You know, you need to pay attention to those things. Are there pets in the home? That you know, just different things that you would run into. Yeah, those are great points, Bev. Same thing. We have a very specific safety training. Um, we actually have a, a member of our board as a retired sheriff. And so the queuing, like Bev said, you know, if in the in a urban area in a drug neighborhood, you know, you don't go in, you go in between 10 and two and you have someone with you. Um, we have had a lot of cases of bed bugs and lice. And so they have to have proper equipment. So they always have a backpack in their car with the appropriate infection control. This was even pre-COVID and we were kind of ahead of a game in that regard. But uh, yeah, safety training is just very critical and, and that's part of the certification process. Uh, so really important. Other items to share or other questions, comments? I just think this is always really helpful to talk about and to kind of keep abreast of what people are doing because you know it's like so many other things you're doing it but you don't know if you're doing it the best way I agree and you know um, I appreciate very much um, Bev and Heather um, sharing what they're doing and you know if 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 at any point the resource center can um, help uh, gather like this a, a group um, to to talk, but um, I know just individually that uh, those of you that run a program are open to having other states call and just chat about you know uh, the intricate <laughs> things that have to be done. Um, so. Appreciate very much again uh, the speakers today, and uh, this recording will be on the NORC website. And we will um, conclude our presentation. I will just uh, mention that uh, uh, the the um, NASOP uh, Professional Development Committee um, put this uh, presentation, uh, got the speakers and everything together. And they are uh, planning to have two uh, training sessions on um, uh, budgeting issues uh, coming up in a couple of weeks and then uh, the next one in September. So hope that you guys will attend those or listen to the recording. So thank you all very much. Have a great day and uh, uh, keep, up the, keep up the good work. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.